We conclude our morning session with a discussion of free speech versus national security, moderated by Paul Rosenzweig, a senior fellow with the R Street Institute, where he works on issues relating to cybersecurity, national security, and tech policy. Mr. Rosenzweig also manages cybersecurity uh, uh, at cybersecurity-focused Red Branch Consulting and teaches at George Washington University School of Law. From 2005 to 2009, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at the United States Department of Homeland Security. It's our privilege to have with us today two individuals who have dedicated their careers to ensuring our national security. The Honorable Tom Ridge, former Governor of Pennsylvania and former U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, and General Michael Hayden, former Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And please join me in welcoming them all to the stage. <clears throat> Following 9-11, Tom Ridge became the first assistant to the President for Homeland Security, and later its first secretary. Before that, he was twice elected governor of Pennsylvania, and his aggressive technology strategy helped fuel the Commonwealth's advances in economic development, Board. education, health care, and the environment. Secretary Ridge served as a United States Army Infantry Staff Sergeant in Vietnam, earning the Bronze Star for Valor, the Combat Infantry Badge, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. He became one of the first Vietnam combat veterans elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served six terms. Today, he is <coughs> chairman of Ridge Global LLC and the Ridge Global Cybersecurity Institute, providing solutions to cybersecurity, international security, and risk management issues. Secretary Ridge also serves on the boards of the Institute for Defense Analyses and the Center for the Study of the Presidency and the Congress. General Michael Hayden is a retired four-star general who served as director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency and was the country's first principal deputy director of national intelligence and the highest ranking military intelligence officer in the country. An alumnus of Duquesne University, General Hayden is an expert on intelligence issues such as cybersecurity, government surveillance, and geopolitics. He knows firsthand <coughs> the delicate balance between liberty and security in intelligence work, as well as the potential challenges that exist when the First Amendment collides with national security. Thank you very much, and, and thanks especially to Duquesne for, for inviting us to join them today. We're, uh, I, I think I speak for everybody, we're really glad to be able to talk to you, especially about something so important, the uh, <clears throat> contrast between, or the tension between free speech and national security. That's been an issue in our nation uh, literally since the foundings, one of the earliest controversies, the Alien and Sedition Laws, was about limits on free speech in service of national security. Uh, often we see those limits as uh, limits on free speech as restrictions on freedoms that are unnecessary, yet sometimes we also see free speech as a problem for national security because the disclosure of information and uh, that is national security secret kind of tends to uh, put at risk some of the important uh, national security interests that the country has. So I, I wanted to start our discussion by kind of talking in that traditional understanding. And, and let me start with you, General Hayden. Um, and rather than be abstract, I want to I want to take you back to a particular incident from from the recent past. Uh, the New York Times uh, was uh, was a quite aggressive uh, reviewer of national security interests during the early years of uh, after 9-11, and in particular disclosed a number of programs uh, by publishing stories, especially ones that revealed a secret NSA program that uh, involved wiretaps and, and, and access to information within the network. So from your perspective, 
Uh, was the New York Times's action an abuse of the freedom of the press? Was it an appropriate reaction? Did it threaten national security? And how does that help us strike this balance? So, not going to help you with the answer here. Um, no. It threatened national security, and it was not an abuse of the First Amendment. Okay. Can, can you give us a, how? Uh, uh, tell us there's a, more. Yeah. Well, tell us a little more about how it how, so, how it was a risk. Yeah. So, so when my public affairs officer at either CIA or NSA would come running down the hall saying, "You won't believe what they got," you got to call the editor. All right. Uh, and I would. Uh, and that applies to this one as well. And I'll give you a little more. Uh, fine print on this particular story, but I, I would always begin the conversation with the editor, with um, Mike Caden at CIA or NSA, thanks for taking the call. And then secondly, look, I understand we both have a role to play when it comes to protecting American liberty and American security, but I'm afraid the way you're about to perform your role is going to make it more difficult for me to perform mine, so we need to talk. And then we would. And, and we, we would have serious discussions uh, with the editor, occasionally with the, with the reporter, uh, him or herself, but with the editor, and, and in order to try to explain why this particular story, number one, may not be true, or this particular story, uh, even if true, uh, should not be out into the public domain uh, because it would create the following effects that would be harmful to American security. And look, it's very important here, is that in a real sense, we're not trying to keep information from the American people. I mean, if, if we could devise a way that the American, that loyal Americans would know far more about what it is we do, we'd actually be happier because we actually think it stands the, the test of scrutiny. We just haven't figured out a way of letting 330 million Americans in on the secret without also informing those against whom we want to use the secret. And so there are such a thing as legitimate American secrets that should not be made, be made public. Now, what, what the papers print is the paper's decision. We had a lively discussion here yesterday for those who were in the afternoon session about prior restraint. Okay, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a rare card to, to play and a very powerful, powerful one. D generally, we don't get into those discussions. We have the dialogue, and then the decision to publish or not publish is legitimately the papers. Unfortunately, in most instances, they do not have the total expertise needed to make that decision. Hence the dialogue, hence the tension. But it's a condition to be managed. It's not a problem that we can solve. Governor Rich? If I could add a couple of thoughts <clears throat> to my colleague, uh, <clears throat> General Hayden. Uh, at the top of the fold <clears throat> in the Washington Post, uh, there is a, in the middle of the page, is a brief statement that says, democracies die in darkness. And that's an absolute truth. There are countries in the world where the whole notion of national security is basically the exclusive, the primary, the only value that that government has to uh, drive all its efforts. Those governments are authoritarian. Those governments are totalitarian because basically what they've said is everything else is subordinate to national security. Well, that's not how we think in this country. That's not how we've thought since we wrote the Constitution. There has historically been, there has historically been this tension between these First Amendments and national security. So I just suggest to you that democracies, democracies dies in darkness. That's an absolute. However, Freedom of the press and freedom of speech is not absolute. There are restraints, just as there are restraints on government authority and government power and government responsibility. So I guess my experience, the general's experience, there are times, there are occasions where the very fact of revealing certain programs, policies, activities, 
of the government, revealing it in the public domain, undermines the other part of the responsibility that a constitutional republic has, and that is create a platform where you can enjoy writ large the freedoms of speech and the freedom of press. So it's uh, freedom of press. So it's a it's a challenge that, uh, regardless of the administration, Republican or Democrat, the policymakers have every single day. So to, to, to round out, you began with the New York Times story. Uh, our arguments were strong enough, and it put aside the final judgment, whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, all right? Just the sequence of events, our arguments were strong enough that this would, this would actually weaken national security, that the Times held the story for 14 months. And, and only later then did the Times make, make a decision to print. And, and so I, I just bring that up to suggest, I mean, both sides of this debate uh, saw the seriousness and both agreed this was an intensely gray area and that we were able to convince the Times to, to delay at least for a year. Let me, let me follow up on that. Uh, Fred Kaplan, who's a, who's a journalist, has written <coughs> that um, the rush or the urge to publish has become greater in the last 15 to 20 years, that it used to be that the press might hold on to something like this out of national security concerns, especially when they didn't see within the program any abuse of authority, any malfeasance or misfeasance of some sort, any violations of law. But today, he wrote, um, that the perception is that uh, the urge towards transparency is greater. The need, perhaps driven by business interests uh, of, the, of, the, of the media, to publish first has gotten so great that he sees a lot less restraint uh, in that regard. Uh, is that consistent with your experience, or, or do you think he's wrong? So uh, one concrete example was in the Snowden revelations. Uh, the Washington Post was in a race with the Guardian in, in Great Britain. And on day two, the, they were pushing the story out the door, what's called the 702 program, has to, has to do with monitoring email traffic. And the Post got it wrong. I mean, the, all the Post had were the, were the slides, all right? The, the kind, of, kind of the administrative briefing, this is what this program does. And, and, and in the slide, it talked about NSA having access to the servers at Google and Hotmail and Gmail and so on, which in reality meant under subpoena from the court, you could go to the companies and say, give me the files of person X, Y, or Z. But the Post read it, and you know, understandably, read it as NSA had tunneled in to, to these domestic uh, email servers. Totally wrong. But they got it wrong b because they were in a race to get the story out, and then had to slowly, and to my point of view, not visibly enough, correct the story as, as it, it, goes, it goes forward. So very often, Paul, so you've got this competition now, it didn't work in this instance. These stories were just too explosive. But very often, when you're able to convince uh, an editor not to go with the story, you do have to make the promise. If we feel, hear, sense anyone else sniffing around this storyline, we will call you so that you can go with your story. Now, that, that, that's probably counterintuitive for some folks in the room, but in the real world, you know, when you're, when you're really trying to you know, this is not the forces of light and the forces of darkness. This is people with different responsibilities inside the republic. We felt it, it almost absolutely essential to make that promise. In other words, we were telling them, you're going to have to go print because somebody else is going to write about it. Governor Reed? I just, you know, I just want to make one observation as well. It's really uh, a reference to uh, General Hayden. But it's also a personal reference based on my experience with the men and women that I work with during my time as Secretary of Homeland Security. Let us not forget that those to whom we have entrusted the security of this country are as equally concerned about the derogation or the diminution of their rights and liberties as the broader public. And sometimes I think we forget that. I was at NSA last week, 
thousands of cars in the parking lot. We literally have hundreds of thousands of men, men and women who go to work every single day, and their job is to try to keep us safe and secure. But because they work for these agencies, there's a tendency, I think, for the general public and sometimes with some very inappropriate comment from folks who don't quite know what they do every single day to conclude that they'll cut corners in order to keep us safe. And I would tell you, that's the wrong conclusion. There is concern about their civil rights and their civil liberties as everybody in this audience. And they bring that same mindset to, the, to their job every single day. And when you get elevated the position that the general's been elevated to, when you pick up the phone, they're able to call these editors and explain that they too, and listen, editors of all our major newspapers have the same responsibility to help keep this country secure. And they have to balance that concern with the First Amendment. We got that. But don't, don't operate under the illusion that those who are in charge of your security are willing to cut corners in order to, to make sure that, that we preserve our liberties and freedoms. Matter of fact, internally, they are probably as introspective as to what they do, and nobody gives any comment about that. You probably should talk a little bit I, about that. I, if you want to find 35,000 experts on the Fourth Amendment, Amen. stand outside the gate at Fort Meade. <laughs> it really is quite true. <laughs> Uh, and all of them are much better versed in it than I am. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me turn to you, Governor Ridge, and kind of chase down a, a point that came from something that General Hayden just said, um, which is that his dis he's describing discussions with what you and I would call traditional media, like the New York Times or the Washington Post, or even the Guardian in Great Britain. How has the advent of non-traditional media, like WikiLeaks, for example, or... Um, or just blogs and, and other alternate forms of information dissemination change the calculus for you? Do you find it harder to deal with them? And does it make it harder to keep secrets? Well, I think the advent of uh, social media and the internet has dramatically changed uh, how information is conveyed. Uh, when, I, when I think of uh, the, uh, the WhatsApp, Google, Facebook, they're unrestrained. There are no standards for what they communicate. There's no geographic boundary. There's no time limitation. And I think one of the challenges that democracies have is separating the wheat from the chaff, truth from fiction, uh, fact from opinion. And I think it really complicates uh, uh, the, the world of government and politics and security in a very significant way. How, and, and I think you and I have had this conversation before, to a certain extent, it can be weaponized to undermine the very system of constitutional values that uh, we hold dear and, and work daily to protect. General Hayden, what do we do about that? <laughs> the, uh, okay, I know, that's the, yeah. that's the obvious question that, that nobody actually has the answer to. Well, no, there, there, there are a lot of good people working on this. So uh, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was in Washington testifying, recall, I mean, it was, Two long days, and uh, actually one of, one of the challenges w w was that the folks asking him questions were not knowledgeable enough about the science and technology about what was going on. But, you know, everyone's heart, everyone's heart was in the right place. But I, but I pointed out, here was an example where technology and ambition had gotten well ahead of law, policy, or norms. And now we as a society are saying what law should apply to this, what policy should apply to this, what norms should we expect. And we've had lively discussions in the last 24 hours up here about how good or bad and how promising or non-promising this is. So there are some practical <coughs> steps. Uh, number one, it is within our reach to a, to a sufficient level of confidence to know when I'm being manipulated in social media by a human being or a bot, and, and, I, and, I, and I do think it, it is technologically possible to, to, to impose filters on social media so that what is being said there is actually traceable, again, to a sufficient level of confidence to a real person rather than a, a bot farm in St. Petersburg or anywhere else that's attempting to manipulate American public opinion. It's a doable do. It doesn't suppress anybody's speech. It, it, it just makes everybody a level set 
individual actor. Number two, the rules on uh, political contributions and political advertisement that we now apply to broadcast media, I think are easily transferable to social media. And then finally, and this is a real tough one, Paul. Um, so I was in, I was in, um, in Sweden last uh, December for actually a session like this. It was truth in the modern world. And there was a, a, a young scholar there, um, Zeynep Tufekci, who was Turkish by birth, North Carolinian by choice, and an expert on social media. And she begins by saying, you know, social media is like a Dorito. Bear with me, I can make this work, hang on. <laughs> she says, a Dorito only looks like a tortilla chip. What it really is, is a delivery mechanism for salt and fat. <laughs> Which of course creates an urging, a craving for more salt and fat. That's social media. You go into social media, it knows you at least as well as you know yourself. The business model, the return on investment is time on the platform, its number of clicks, so it wants you to stay. So what it will present to you in a first order, since it knows you so well, is that which will keep you there, that which confirms your going in positions. And the longer you stay on it, the algorithm, the core algorithm, will drive you to more confident, more extreme expressions of your starting point. And so the, the, the actual way it works is rather than driving you to some sort of global comments for dialogue, it is actually bends you away from the center and into the darkest corners of your self-identified ghetto. And, and, and that poisons discourse. And that is the core algorithm of social media. This is a big problem. Don't believe me, believe Roger McNamee, who was president of the creation at Facebook, uh, an early mentor, early contributor to the Zuckerberg enterprise. He has written about this extensively, mm -hmm. saying it's not the fringe, it, it's not the bots, it's not the untruth, it's the algorithm. And, and so we've, we've, got, we've got work to do. An idea expressed yesterday was to break up Ma Bell, was, was to break up the big um, social media platforms into smaller, more competitive ones that would at least drive you into corners that might be different for each one of the platforms. Governor Rich? Uh, yeah, I, General, I, I, I hear what you're saying and, and I do believe that technology has a role in helping us deal with this issue. Artificial intelligence, yeah. presumably which we're talking about and there's so much being developed in that space today. But again, it's who constructs the algorithm. And I think that's a critical question to ask. Does government construct it? Does the private sector construct it? So I think one of the challenges, and I think there's a lot, the advance of technology may enable us in time but I'm not, and I'm not doubting the role it can play, but at, at what point in time, this is what's troubled me about social media for the longest time, what's fact, what's fiction? Who's the fact checker? And at some point in time, as you take a look at social media today, I'm not sure people will use it to be informed or to be educated. More often than not, it's used to reinforce a certain set of beliefs already. And so I don't know whether or not, I'd like to think the algorithms could help, but I'd also like to think that some input from people as fact checkers, maybe third parties, we've talked about this. I'm familiar with an organization called NewsGuard. Fascinating organization, ladies and gentlemen, established by two individuals who are 180, opposed philosophically and politically. They pulled together a dozen journalists writ large, and they've set a set of standards, and they go take a look at websites, and they, they grade. There's a color code, by the way, yep. which I had nothing to do with. <laughs> um, and they, they take a look at a site and see if there's a conflict of interest, if they've truly distinguished between fact and fiction, how accurate are they, uh, do they have any conflicts of interest and like so. Well, I'd like to think that technology could help us get through this, the abuse of this extraordinary capability that's global in nature, 
and it's being abused both nationally and internationally. We know that. Uh, relying strictly on technology to help us also think that maybe down the road, the world, at least 330 million Americans will be a little more demanding of facts and truth and be a little bit more open-minded to another point of view, which helps us get to a better place. Both the governor and I advise NewsGuard, and let me second his recommendation. It's a very simple evaluation. I think there are a dozen criteria, yeah. and they're not judging a story. All right, they're not suppressing a story. They, 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 are, they are judging and grading the site. And, and so that RT and Sputnik have certain grades as opposed to CNN and Fox News and the New York Times and, and so on. So, so that the reader has a sense as to how much confidence he or she should put yeah, in yeah. to a particular story. I compare it to Rotten Tomatoes. All right? Yeah. Now, I've, I've gone against their recommendations and seen some really bad movies. Okay? But I knew what I was getting into. <laughs> ne never disregard Rotten Tomatoes. That's my point. So, so, so let me, let me. I don't know how that got into this discussion here, but there tortilla you go. chips, Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, Come on, yeah, work with go. us here. So, so, so let me let me take what we've just discussed and let me ask this question in the most provoc deliberately provocative way that I know how. Is unfettered social media? a national security threat to the integrity of American democracy? And, and if your answer is sort of or maybe or a little, then does that change the calculus for you in our tradition? Because you began by saying the freedom of the press is a, is a critical role and we all agree, <clears throat> but would that, would that not change if that very freedom is itself a threat to democracy? Uh, either one of you can go and then I'll let the other one go f after. Well, I, I think it's abuse as is anything else as a potential threat and how we restrain the abuse. Look, it, it is a weapon. I mean, if you were former, a former KGB agent who was responsible for destabilizing other countries and suddenly you rose up through the KGB and you became head of a, uh, a major uh, opponent to this country, and suddenly you had digital tools at your disposal and you could start playing around an election. Oh my goodness, you have been, you've done your job. You have destabilized a democracy. Mm -hmm. so you've achieved your goal. So yes, the abuse of the social media and planning false stories and accusations and things of that sort absolutely is a threat because the ultimate threat, I think, democracy is undermining the trust that people have and the men and women they elect, and the men and women who take it upon themselves to serve government. And I think that's the abuse undermines trust, and once trust is undermined, democracy is threatened, because the whole system of this constitutional republic is built upon trust. Uh, it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's an inevitable thing. And we, we, we are not in the habit of this, in this country, of, of shaping our political or social or press cultures to meet the demands of security. And, and, and so our, our belief is that the security establishment accommodates to the broader political culture within which it exists. This is a reality in the political culture. You can't make it go away. So, so the yes. governor's point is you guard against abuse. You, you, you get on, remember, remember I said ambition and technology out of head of law, policy, and norms. Well, let's get on the law, policy, and norms part so, we, so we, can, we can better operate in an inevitably different environment. So you, you Governor, you, you talked about trust and the erosion of trust as, as, a, as a downfall uh, of democracy. One of the things that uh, I think many have seen in the last few years is that there's been an erosion of trust in the institution of the press itself, that increasingly Americans have come to see uh, the press as uh, not a neutral arbiter, but as, as, as a, a biased arbiter on one side or the other. Um, is the erosion of belief in the value of free press also a national security concern? Well, as uh, many people in the audience know, I've been privileged to serve in the, an elected office for quite some time <coughs> in my career. And, uh, 
obviously dealt on a daily basis with the press. And the press uh, and the First Amendment uh, freedom uh, was not designed to make government and elected officials happy. Uh, part of their job and their responsibility is to inform, to educate. Uh, part of their responsibility is to probe and push, to question, and that they do. Um, and to the extent that we declare, and public officials declare, that the press is the enemy of the people, or that uh, press are mean, horrible people, when we start denigrating one of those institutions uh, and ignore the reality and the importance of that First Amendment, we begin to undermine the very trust that historically people have placed in the press. I don't believe democracies can exist without a free press. And to the extent that anybody tries to under, uh, undercut the press, claim, listen, clearly, clearly, there are biases and prejudices. We all have them. They exist, and sometimes they're projected in the press. But I dare say there's not a single there's not a single democracy in the world that could exist without those roles being fulfilled by the press. Inform, educate, probe, challenge, question. And uh, when you undermine that, I mean, it, 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 you begin to undermine trust in one of the most basic freedoms, I believe, that are absolutely essential to the function of democracy, notwithstanding the fact they don't always get it right. Sometimes the criticism is wrong. Sometimes the bias shows through. But by and large, it's just to undermine the trust in the free press, you're beginning to undermine one of the, the cornerstones of a democracy, period. So uh, one anecdote that might reinforce what the governor just said. Uh, we had a league case during my late years at CIA. It was a story uh, in a book by a New York Times correspondent, Jim Risen, had to do with a covert action against the Iranian nuclear program. And the, the FBI had a suspect, a former CIA case officer. I can mention his name now because the things worked its way through the court and he was actually convicted, uh, Jeffrey Sterling. And the, so the Bureau comes to me as their investigation is getting more mature and, and simply says, uh, we're getting close, we think we know who, um, but we're gonna have to say an awful lot in court to make this stand. And there are a lot of things that have not yet been exposed that you're going to have to expose in court in order to get a conviction. What's your view? And my answer was, whatever you need. Because at that point in time, the, 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 the reflexive decision was, whoa, can't do that. Well, I'm gonna, just gonna have to let that go. Which is a, an individually correct tactical and operational decision whose overall strategic effect was to allow the leaking of legitimate American secrets to go on uh, unrecorded and unpunished. And I said, whatever it takes in terms of revealing secrets. Now I'm out of government, all right? And I'm being interviewed on 60 Minutes. And, and this case is making its way through the court system. And the Bureau wants to make the New York Times correspondent, Jim Risen, testify and reveal a source. And so I'm asked on 60 Minutes, do you think they should subpoena Jim Risen and put him in jail if he does not reveal his source? And my answer was, oh my God, absolutely not. And it was, wow, well, that's surprising. I thought you were interested in the conviction. I, yeah, but, but not at the expense of the collateral damage to the First Amendment that would be done by forcing a correspondent to testify and reveal his sources. That's the dynamic tension. That, that's, oh no, look, I was, I was all out getting the conviction, all right? But, but that's the dynamic tension, which I think the governor was, was trying to describe here, that, that there, there are competing first principles here. And, and sometimes you have to defer to the more important one back there, uh, even in a, a legitimate case, to find out why a secret is now public. Yeah, it's an interesting head note. You know, the Constitutional Convention <coughs> was held in secrecy and privacy. They didn't want the press to know because of that the controversy might inhibit their ability to find common cause. So again, I guess since those days in Philadelphia, 1789, we've been dealing with the tension between press and uh, security for a long time. Oh, 
So can you, can you imagine any exceptions to that? Any instances in which um, uh, the free press should yield to security interests uh, and where, where you might change your views? I, I mean, I, I agree with you completely, but as a, oh. as a theoretical matter, but as a practical matter, are there any limits? Or is the First, uh, or is the first Amendment so, uh, so sacrosanct that it, that it knows no limitation? Well, okay. either one. Uh, well, no, I, I'll, I'll start I, with you, I, Governor. Again, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to deal in absolutes. Uh, and I think it's very dangerous to say transparency is an absolute or national security is an absolute. I think it's always fact-based. Uh, but I think it's pretty, there should probably be a, there's probably a consensus even within this audience as to the kinds of things that should not be revealed publicly because it would undermine the very efforts that the government is taking across the board to preserve the democracy, to preserve our value system, to preserve our way of life. And again, I think it's got to be driven by facts. Clearly, if there's wrongdoing, unethical behavior, illegal activity, you can't use national security as a blanket to cover that kind of activity up. But beyond that, we have to be very careful how we proceed. There, there was a fascinating discussion here yesterday afternoon. Floyd Abrams was on stage and talking about the Pentagon Papers case and the whole issue of prior restraint. And you recall in, in that particular case, the court ruled against the Nixon administration, yeah. but it was a very narrow ruling. And it was, it was pointed out yesterday that, that, that government had not made a sufficient case for the truly catastrophic damage that would be done by the release of, of the Pentagon Papers, which, which is simply saying, if you got a better case, come back. If you got another issue where the damage would be more obvious and more immediate, come back. And, and so the Constitution allows for the court to actually decide against the absolute application of the amendment uh, that's behind us. And in the case you asked about, the, the surveillance program, when the, when the Times came back a year later and said, we think we want to go with the story, we, we, we argued vehemently against it. And, and, and they left the Oval Office. I mean, this is up to the president talking to the editor and the publisher. All right? and, and then they left the Oval Office with a promise that if they would go with the story, they would let us know, and we would have a chance to at least comment and, and try to cabin the, the effect of the story. They did not. They popped it on their website, and then they called us. It was already out. And they did out of a fear of prior restraint. They actually thought we would go to the court for prior restraint and not allow them to publish. And, and again, to, to show you how high the bar is before even a conservative Republican administration would go to the court to, to, to try to get a prior restraint injunction, we never even talked about it inside uh, the Bush administration. When they came with the prior restraint story, we said, what are you talking about? We, we, and so even within the government, even among the security types, uh, the, the issues that would be required before you would invoke something like that are, are almost beyond imagination. I think it's interesting to the Pentagon Papers, um, the decision w was narrowly construed, but and when you think about it, there's what, seven or 8,000 pages yeah. Uh, and actually, Ellsberg himself had been part of the analytical team that had written. It was really questioning a series of decisions that policymakers had, and even them saying, in spite of the conclusions they reached, that it being unsustainable, that they couldn't possibly win. They continued to promote the war, so it was a reflection. Again, it wasn't necessarily a leak that posed immediate irreparable harm. That's presumably why the court said, if you can show us how this is right. perhaps undermining our ability to prosecute the war or something else, we'll be willing to entertain it. Uh, and I think that is not necessarily the standard, but if, it, if you can make the case that this revelation will impede the NSA or anybody else from doing what they need to do in this very perilous world, I do think, ladies and gentlemen, we have, we have to be, we may long for the, the good old days, the Cold War, when there was one, not multiple, sovereigns with capabilities to do us harm before the advent, the advent and the metastasizing of terrorism, before the internet, global connection and global vulnerability. So again, as we look to those responsible for our security in this country, I do want us to view it 
and with an understanding that the world with which they operate and in which they work and are required and doing every day to keep us safe and secure is never been as complicated as challenging. And this tension between that First Amendment and those national securities in a constitutional republic will always be a point of controversy and competition and contention, but by itself is a reflection of the strength of the Constitution because we are publicly talking about it and we do <laughs> publicly challenge one another. And I think, again, if you're talking to me, I think democracy, one of the cornerstones of the democracy is that First Amendment. So I, I think you'll all agree with me that A, we had far too little time <laughs> to discuss such a, a significant issue. And I think we can all be proud as Americans that uh, the people who serve our national interests are not only experts in the Fourth Amendment, but also quite self-evidently in the First Amendment. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah.